This podcast is proudly sponsored by the Catholic Order of Foresters, a Catholic fraternal benefit society dedicated to helping members achieve financial security through life insurance while supporting the Catholic community through fraternal outreach. Hey folks, welcome back to Ever Ancient, Ever New. I'm your host, Jeremy, here with Father Kyle Kowalsik. That's me. And um, we're going to talk about the Old Testament today because as I came into the Catholic Church, uh, I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that the Old Testament probably came alive for me. I mean, mm. certainly all of Scripture came alive and then it filled in the gaps, um, but the Old Testament took on a, a whole radical new... I mean, first of all, it was <laughs> there were seven whole books I had not read. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting caught up there. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that's... I remember, I remember a, a, a priest saying, um, on every page of the Old Testament, you got to be looking for Jesus, yeah. Mary, the Church, the saints, the sacraments. Like that's how we read the Old Testament yeah. in, in light of the New Testament. That was Saint Augustine's quote: "The New Testament lies hidden in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is unveiled." In the new, yeah. So we don't read it just like as an historical document, like okay, this is what the Jews believe. That's nice. Yeah. You know, we actually read it uh, in light of the, the fulfillment of Revelation. In fact, it's fun. Uh, I have a Jewish study Bible, Ooh. and so it's it's really fun because you kind of like read the the notes there and stuff, and they'll 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 say something like, yeah, we think that this this means something like something about the Messiah to come. I forget what I should, I, I'll look it up sometime. We can discuss it, but it was talking about the ancient circumcision and they were huh. talking about this. And, and then it's like, yeah, we think this, this means like, you know, the Messiah will like, you know, shed his blood or something like, and, like, and I'm like, well, <laughs> duh, <laughs> you know, it's like, wow. you know, um, Oh, that's interesting. I'd like to read that. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's fascinating once, I mean, we we read you know it's, it, it's helpful to get a Jewish perspective of like Absolutely. you know that this is what it meant in the writing of it right you know, we talked about that before like what what's the original intent of the authors but in the audience yeah at the time but but Jews don't know the Old Testament better than Christians yeah. Christians know the Old Testament better than Jews because it's been fulfilled it's been fulfilled it's a completion it's not it's not a new thing it's it's uh, it's part Part two. <laughs> yeah, the I think it was Bishop Barron. I, I don't think he coined this, but he described the drama of salvation in five acts. Hmm. Um, act one being the creation. Uh, it was a very short act, or very long, I suppose, depending on <laughs> right. how you look at it. Act two was the fall. Um, act three was the um, the sort of founding or creation of God's chosen people. Act four is the Messiah. And then act five is what we're in right now, which is the church, Th- that that really helps scripture come alive to me because scripture is everything. Yeah. It's everything. And to be able to read it in light of that, well, then you start to look at Melchizedek, this very mysterious character in a new way. Um, you start to look certainly at David in a new way because Jesus, of course, quotes the Psalms so much. Um, you start to look at the prophets in a new way and seeing the pieces, all these pieces I'd missed before where they were talking about the Messiah. And frankly, I started to read some of the Old Testament books that I just kind of ignored before. Not just the ones I didn't even know were there, um, but like Minor Prophets. So for me, a big, like the big revelation verse <clears throat> from the Minor Prophets was Malachi 1.11. That was for me a verse that just like, oh. and it says, for from the rising of the sun even to the going down, my name is great among the Gentiles, and in every place there is a sacrifice, and there is offered to my name a clean oblation, for my name is great among the Gentiles, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, in the context of today, you know, I would just sort of probably have skipped right over that verse, assuming I'd ever even read that verse. I mean, I've been reading the Bible for about 30 years. Right, we'd probably be like, oh yeah, the Jews, they had their temple, and they offered sacrifice, and great, that's a nice historical tidbit. Yeah, yeah, but... That's a, it's a prophecy is what never occurred to me. Like, this is a future thing. And so now in light of Christ's church, from the rising of the sun to its going down, so that's every day, uh, a clean oblation is offered. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> and then uh, you look at the Didache. So this was, this was my first exposure to 
you know, Catholicism was my little brother opening up this little book called the Didache that I'd never heard about, the writings of the apostles, the sort of first kind of initial um, catechism for new Christians, I think AD 70 roughly. So this predates some of the books of the Bible. And this is pulled right, right from the Didache. Um, these are the instructions for new Christians, assemble on the Lord's day and break bread and offer the Eucharist. <laughs> but make confession of your faults so that your sacrifice may be a pure one. This is the first thing my brother read to me. Anyone who has a difference with this fellow is not to take part with you until he has been reconciled so as to avoid any profanation of your sacrifice. And then it references Matthew 5, 23 through 24. For this is the offering of which the Lord has said, everywhere and always bring to me a sacrifice that is undefiled, for I am great. a great king, says the Lord, and my name is the wonder of nations. And then it references Malachi 1, 11 and 14. And that's Didache uh, uh, 14 and roughly 80, 70. <laughs> so you know, for me, putting those two things together, I thought, well, okay, every hour of every day. I, see, before I was Catholic, I didn't know there was Mass every day. And so you're just looking like around the world. Yeah, maybe somebody doesn't know who's listening. There's Mass every single day. Every day. day. I, remember hearing, I remember hearing Scott Hahn say this years ago. He said, I don't know where he got this stat, every day, not Sundays, but every single, just every day, there's 300,000 masses happening in that day in, oh, across the world. 300,000 masses. Sundays, I mean, everybody knows, I mean, Sundays priests are saying two, three, four masses. Yeah. I mean, so just on every, like a Wednesday, there's 300,000 masses going. How many are being said on, on, on Sunday? Uh, like 10 and times that. Like a, times a million? Like, I, don't know. I mean, it's like, I, yeah, it's, like mass every day. So... And that's it. So like non Christians don't get this. Like Sunday, maybe you have Wednesday, something on Wednesday. Yeah. But non right. non Catholics, you know, it's, it's like not every every day. Yeah. I say mass every single day. Every day. I have people come to mass every single day. Yeah. And so, and we're talking twenty four hour period. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we go back to that conversation. An actual twenty four hour period. All right. There were three hundred thousand masses said all around the world. So it is accurate to say that every hour of every day, actually three hundred thousand, it m must be every minute. Of every I day. mean, we could do the math, but that's not what we're here for. Okay. So, uh, there is a mass being offered, a clean oblation, right? Christ, the Eucharist, the offering of thanksgiving um, on the altar. Not re-sacrificed, right, but represented in the fulfillment of Malachi. And if you go through the church fathers, you have... Um, it's 12,500 per uh, hour. Oh, wow. Just... Um, oh, jeez. That's good. So now. about 208 per minute. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, I just... <laughs> That's amazing, though, isn't it? You have Justin Martyr referencing in, in the dialogue with Trifo in roughly 80, uh, 155, um, Malachi 111. Uh, Irenaeus in roughly 81, 89, and against heresies, references Malachi 111 as the Mass. Uh, I mean, it, it just goes, it goes on and on. Right, um, and I mean, these, yeah, these are early church writers, fathers, like... In the this second is, century. This is how they understood the Old Testament. And that's extra really important for, for us. Like, how, how, do you, how do you want to interpret Scripture? Well, you want to interpret it the way that it's been interpreted by really smart, holy people. That's a good place to start. Yeah, this is what uh, Father, the late Father Thomas Dubé said. He's like, the best exegetes of Scripture, the best Scripture scholars, are not the guys who went to school for the longest or the most degrees or, you know, speak the most foreign languages. The best exegetes are... The saints. Yeah. You want to know what you want to know what a scripture passage means? Read a saint because he knows Jesus, yeah, and the yeah. word is Jesus. Right. I, this is a correction I make a lot. I I understand the concept of calling the Bible the Word of God. A small W. Right. John, of course, one teaches us that Jesus is the Word, and before the phrase Word of God, we always used it to mean the Bible. And when I look through scripture, I most never see that reference as the word of God being referred to a book called the Bible, not least which because the Bible doesn't actually refer to itself <laughs> anywhere in the New Testament. Um, but that's such a beautiful tie-in. To know Jesus, to really know him, and of course that's a probably one of the ten episodes on what that means, um, is to be able to have the scriptures open and come alive yeah. um, in that way. But that verse for me, going back to the Old Testament, I mean, you, you find that the sort of the Jewish roots of the church, even the Catholic Church in general, like if if you go if, if you were a Augustine thrust into the twenty first century sitting in a traditional Latin mass, he would know exactly what was going on, right? But if you were also Augustine thrust backwards 
pre-Christ to Jewish temple worship. It actually looked pretty similar in their prayer liturgy, right? And their sacrifice, their incense. Um, but now, of course, we have Christ. We have a Messiah. And I, that was a piece I could never put together. Like Nowhere did Scripture say that kind of liturgical style of worship was going to go away. Mm -hmm. Certainly they were forced underground. I, I think 1 Corinthians, we talked about that verse, 1 Corinthians 4, where Paul kind of lays out when you gather together, you know, do this. So the, the Mass, is, ironically, the Mass is more in the Bible than the services that I experienced, as wonderful as they were, um, as, as much as they really desired to honor Jesus Christ, as, a, as much of a great outreach as they were to people that did not know Jesus. When I opened Scripture, I couldn't find that former style of worship, but I can find the form and liturgy of the Mass back in the Old Testament, uh, even in their, the beauty of the temples. I mean, God was asking them to make insanely large and beautiful temples. And when you walk in the Basilica Cathedral, I mean, you're really transported back, even pre-Christ, to that, that style of temple worship on what it must have looked like to have been in the temple uh, in Jerusalem. I mean, it really blows in mind, but you get a taste of that, of course, in the yeah, you know, that's something I, I came to early on when I was starting to dive into the Bible and, and things when I was in my 20s. And uh, yeah, you read, you read the instructions on building, even before the temple, I mean, the, the tent in the wilderness was exquisite. <laughs> you know, the, you were, they, weren't, they weren't camping out in the boundary waters. Right. You know? this, is, this is exquisite. Um, the, the, the rubrics on, you know, what the priest was to wear from head to foot, how he was supposed to prepare to dress. And, and then we've, um, yeah, in some sense, like, yeah, we, well, we got rid of all that. Well, when, when did we get rid of all yeah, that? When, when and where? Why? What, what part of, where, <laughs> where in scripture do you see we got rid of all that? Are they essential things? No, they're not essential sure. things, but... Uh, we dress up things that are important. Anyway, we're kind of getting off onto a liturgical tirade, which uh, wasn't necessarily the intent. But actually, the, the the scripture passage that I was thinking about that just recently this this last week hit me. Uh, I was reading from Jeremiah in the Liturgy of the Hours, the Office of Readings, which is the prayer that the priests pray every uh, every day, and 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 consider I've I've read the Book of Jeremiah in this particular passage ten times, maybe. Huh you know, in the course of my, my life. So 10 times I've heard this, and, and something hit me new the other day. I was, I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Was that, was that there last time? Um, <laughs> I love that feeling. So uh, here we are. Jeremiah's talking about uh, the temple, um, and I'll just read this, this section that kind of jumped out to me. Um, uh has, has this house which bears my name become in your eyes a den of thieves? Okay, we remember that, yeah. right? Doesn't somebody say that in the New Testament? Uh, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, so we, know, we know that. Um, and he keeps going. I too see what is being done, says the Lord. You may go to Shiloh, which I made the dwelling place of my name in the beginning. See what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. And now because you have committed all these misdeeds, says the Lord, because you did not listen, though I spoke to you untiringly, because you did not answer, though I called, I will do to this house named after me, in which you trust, and to this place which I gave to you and your fathers, just as I did to Shiloh. I will cast you away from me as I cast away all your brethren, all the offspring of Ephraim. Huh. So what did you do to Shiloh? Is there still a temple in Shiloh? No. No, there's nothing in Shiloh. So, i.e., he, he let it be destroyed, right? Right. So, flash forward into the New Testament, right? Jesus, he goes, and we can read it in Matthew 21, he goes to the temple, and what does he say? He, turn, he overturns the tables, the money changers, seats of those who are selling doves, and he said to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of of thieves. All right, and you're like, oh, okay, that, that was, you know, good correction by Jesus telling them like, okay, you're not you're not doing it. But but no, no. In order to understand what Jesus is saying, which the Jews would have because they knew Jeremiah Correct. well, they're they're studied literary literary men, the Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes. They would have gone, well, the Sadducees didn't look at Jeremiah. That's <laughs> true. Um, so 
go, we got to go back to here and say, and, and God's saying to the people, you've, you've made my house a den of thieves, but we don't stop there. We read in this context. Well, what does he say after, what does God say after he said, you made this into the den of thieves? He's going to destroy it. He's going to destroy it. So why were ever, why was everybody so mad at Jesus for like going in like hey this crazy guy just came and like threw our money on the table and said we were a den of thieves? <laughs> no, that's not what he said. That's right. He said God is going to destroy this temple. Yeah. Like and they got that. This is why they were so upset with him. This is why you know six days later they crucified him because they they saw it as a threat, as a blasphemy. You don't you don't mess with our temple, and now you got to get what's coming to you. Right. Wow. You know, so again, like I've I've read that passage from Jeremiah ten times, but something is just just struck me new uh, this time, or maybe I wasn't paying attention well enough all well, the time. Well, it's interesting because I was my my dad's one of his favorite books in the Bible is Jeremiah, and that's how I got my name. Oh yeah, uh, was after Jeremiah, and I I I decided I need to spend like a serious focused amount of time in Jeremiah and Isaiah uh, is two sort of major prophets because mm-hmm. there's so much Christ there. And of course, in the, this, this great adventure of, of Christianity, my, our great desire is just more Jesus. How can I just get more Jesus? Right? right? <laughs> um, whether it's in scripture or through prayer, in the mass, of course, is this incredible touch of Jesus. I, I, I can't get anywhere else. But there are these two men, Jeremiah and Isaiah, and you just proved this great point, um, who had this an unbelievable connection to Christ. And they really, I, how much of that were they even aware of, you know, at the time? Like, I always wondered, how much did they know? Right. Like, whatever they were speaking in, in inspiration of the Holy Spirit, what did they, what else did they know? They said what they were supposed to say. But how much of it was foreign to them when it came out of their mouth? You know what I mean? Like, was Jeremiah, when he spoke that, was he understanding one day the Messiah is going to use these words? Right, it's like, this, this is good. <laughs> this, is real, this is good. I know this is good. And I, wanna, I wanted to talk. <laughs> I wanted to talk to a really trained rabbi just because I'm curious. Like, okay, so maybe they just look at Christ as sort of this great manipulator of, of words. Mm. Um. And of course, his effect on history is what is so profound and so undeniable, especially and uniquely, of course, in the Catholic Church and in Catholicism. But I'm always curious, because there are some incredible uh, um, rabbis who I, I read fairly regularly that just have a tremendous insight into morality, into God. And I'm always curious, like, how do you, how do you not put those together? Like, what do they see even mm. now, 2,000 years later removed? When they read a verse like that and they look at the life of Christ and the New Testament and, you know, the next 2,000 years, because it's just baffling to me. Right. Well, I mean, that's what St. Paul says in the second letter to the Corinthians that, you know, talk, he's talking about the people at Moses' time and Moses would have to wear a veil over his face after he'd go talk to God. And he says the Jewish people still have a veil over their over their eyes, their hearts, um, you know, and, and I mean, and, and I think until, until the Lord removes this, and this is all of us, you know, it's not, it's not the Jews, it's, right. it's you before you converted, it's me before I came into my faith when I was um, in, in high school and college. Um, it, it's all of us. We have that, we have that veil. And, right. You know, we pray that the Lord puts us in that spot to, to un, unveil us so that we can, we can see. And I've actually talked to a, a man who was was Jewish and converted, and oh wow, you know he, that's what he said. It's like, a a lot of Jews just they just don't know about Jesus at all. Huh? You know, like nobody's nobody's told them about them, and if they do, like oh yeah, we, we've heard something about that, but it'd be kind of like you know us hearing about David Koresh or something. Like yeah, you heard about that that prophet guy? Wow, it's like, that's crazy. Oh yeah, he was crazy and killed himself and a bunch of other people by mass suicide, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, that guy. And so I think it'd probably be something that to that effect. I mean, as, as Christians, we're like yeah, we're we're eating and drinking Jesus, literally, um, but. So we just kind of think that, and we kind of tend to live in our bubble too, right. you know. So we're like, we don't realize how little Jesus is spoken of out in the world. Oh, for shame! Shame I rem- on us. I remember, yeah, 
I, I remember when um, remember when the Passion of the Christ movie came out. Oh my gosh, yeah. I remember a friend of mine sharing that um, they overheard in the in the movie theater or somebody talking about like, oh yeah, I've I've heard of Jesus. He was he was like a Roman general or something. <laughs> Jeez. Like whoa. Wow. Yeah, you've heard nothing about <laughs> so Jesus, actually. Nothing. That's it is hard to believe. i I would hope the Passion of the Christ um, changed that. All right. I mean, with the, the sheer amount of people um, that saw that that film, but it is interesting to wonder. Outside of our bubble, we we very easily get stuck in, in bubbles. It's yeah. an interesting sociological book, on how people just get sort of, locked into their bubbles. But to know God. And again, one of the great ways to know him is through scripture, um, is to me so much larger than, well, I read the Bible and thus I know everything that I need. I mean, that God is in science, he's in truth, he's in good, and he's in beauty, he's in all of these things that need sort of exploration. I just didn't know, and I don't know that anyone knows, depending on which denomination you're talking to, like what exegesis means and well, who do you trust and, and all of that. But even if I put all that aside, just just a little window into the early church was all it took for me to open up the Old Testament and go, oh, that's strange. Hmm. Like, that's really strange. And so then you start, um, even in Psalms, there's, I think it's Psalm 40, there's a brief reference to the queen. Mm-hmm. There's a capital Q. And I think Psalm 40 was written by these, these brothers, um, I can't remember the passage offhand, but that was another one like, oh, that's interesting. Who's the queen? If I went to the New International Version, they changed the word queen to bride. Hmm. I was like, oh, that's, that's not the word, though. <laughs> the word is queen. Um, and you know, some, again, uh, uh, biblical scholars that aren't um, totally opposed to Mary see a reference to a queen there. And, of course, who was, when Solomon was king, who was the queen? It was his mother. And in, in Judah, the tribe of Judah, the queen was always the mother. What are the references there as of, of Christ now as our king in all of that? So I, again, another just brief pass into the Old Testament was like, okay, so even the kings and the kingdom and the rule and all of that and the, the line of David, like there's all these unbelievable references um, to Jesus here and his church here. Not as, a, not as, because what did he say that, right? The kingdom is, this is the, another great paradox. My kingdom is here, but it's also coming, right? And so you look at the, even the hierarchy of the church we talked about. It's not a king. The Pope is not a king. But there are roots there of how Christ manages and orders his, um, his people. And we're not kingless. Christ is our king. He's our head. You know, he is the head of his church. But there were always these visible representatives on earth that Christ used to help communicate to his people. Moses is a great example of that. David is a great example of that. Imperfect as it was, um, and of course, God's original plan, you know, wasn't, well, the people want a king, I'm going to give them a king. But I am their king, Mm -hmm. but they want a human king. And we talked again about that to sort of the opening of the mind, how long it took from the fall to the Messiah for Jesus, for God to prepare humanity to receive, even comprehend like Jesus yeah. and Messiah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I think, I think what we're we're talking about too is like, you don't have to be a, a scripture scholar right. to do what we're saying, or like make the scripture come alive. Um, you know, I, I think maybe the takeaways for today is like, just don't be afraid of the Old Testament. Yeah, like actually, actually read it. Get it. Get a Bible um, that has like. Tons of footnotes and cross references, especially cross references. Footnotes, like you know, sometimes they're good or sometimes they're bad, depending on who's who's writing them. But the cross references are like, hey, this is where this passage was quoted in the New Testament by Paul or Jesus or Peter, and like, do do that whichever direction you want. Read read John and cross reference the Old Testament, or you know, pick somewhere in in the Old Testament and cross reference the New Testament. But follow follow the the, the wormhole of all the cross references, and and don't just read the verse that was quoted, but right. read around it. See right. what see what the context was. See what uh, what what Jesus is saying when he says, "Have you not heard that it was written, 
well, read the whole thing. He's giving you a little snippet. Right. You know, it's kind of like us saying, and haven't you seen... There's a paraphrase. Yeah. Right, yeah. Right. Have, you know... Yeah, I haven't you seen the Avengers? Like, oh yeah, I know, I know everything now. I got the whole Avengers story in my head now. Yeah. He says, do you remember when David went to the, you know, went to the priest, and I was like, okay, now I got the whole, the whole thing in my right. head. Right. We got to get the whole context. But yeah, I mean, I mean, that's a, it'd be a fascinating, and you'd never exhaust the scriptures. Oh my gosh, you know? it would take a couple of lifetimes, I would imagine. Yeah. Jimmy Aiken did something very uh, uh, interesting. For those who don't know, Jimmy Aiken is a, a Catholic apologist. He's got a podcast, too. You can listen to that. We're not afraid of plugging other people's yeah. podcasts. Yeah, he's great. Jimmy's great, but he has a whole cross-reference of the uh, Deuterocanonical books, mm. or what, what many Protestants refer to as the Apocrypha. That was really fascinating. Mm. Um, now, and he, he's pretty honest there, um, that uh, oftentimes there's not a direct cross-reference, but it's an enormous... Uh, if you just Google Jimmy Akin uh, Deuterocanonical or Deuterocanon, you'll find it. That's like the second option on, on Google. It's just this massive list of, here's something Jesus said in Matthew. Here's where you can find that same thought in the Book of Wisdom. Mm, nice. And he goes he goes down. I was, the biggest I've seen, um, and that, again, is... Uh, as I've opened up, you know, even the book of Sirach has been like a huge blessing to me. Um, finding yeah. those oh, cross yeah. references, geez, was like, I didn't even know these books. <laughs> again, hey. for me, it's becoming a boy again. It's like, brand new books? Yeah, well, I, have my, I have my old Bible. It's just like early on when I was reading through and like, you know, just getting fascinated with the faith. And like, I'm like highlighting stuff and I'm like, Jesus, you know, the Old Testament, like Sirach. Like, this is totally like talking about Jesus. This is talking, totally talking about Mary in the book of wisdom. <laughs> You know. Oh, I need to look that up later. Oh, so much good, so much good in uh, in the scriptures. Thank you for joining us today for another uh, another episode of Every Ancient Ever New. We'll uh, we'll see you next time. All right. At Catholic Order of Foresters, we're committed to bringing Catholic values to life and financially protecting Catholic families right here in Minnesota. Our members enjoy benefits like scholarship eligibility and peace of mind knowing their family is secure, even if something happens to them. Each year, thousands join us to support people in need through our Feeding God's Children events, spirituality tap-ins, and mission trips. Wouldn't you love to be a part of an organization that embodies your Catholic values? Find out how you can be a part of Catholic Order of Foresters by calling General Agent Brian Markiton at 763-658-4009. That's Brian at 763-658-4009.